I'm with uh, Dennis Snarrow, who is the president of the Kiel Institute, which is a uh, joint venture partner of the uh, uh, Institute for New Economic Thinking. Dennis, thanks for uh, being with me. Um, I wanted to talk to you because um, you've written a very interesting paper here about uh, uh, the Eurozone crisis. Um, and um, I think that one of the, th the, the issues that we have is that um, there's a, the, the, the German perspective, if you like, uh, it's, it's, um, it, there's a multiple views, but I think it doesn't get fairly reflected I, I, much in the, in, in the press. And I think you've got a rather unique perspective. So I was wondering if you'd care to elaborate on this paper and some of the conclusions that you've come up with. Mm. I think the German perspective on the Eurozone, Germany speaks with many voices. Of course, but yeah. One really important perspective uh, that doesn't receive much airtime in the public debate is a much more balanced perspective than people from the outside see. And they see that the Eurozone crisis is a crisis that arises out of divergent interests. You've got the creditor countries and the debtor countries that have different interests. And if the Eurozone fell apart, there would be huge losses to everyone concerned. Mm -hmm. And if it stays together, there'll be continued gains. Mm -hmm. So therefore, it should not be difficult to create a win-win situation where both the creditor and the debtor countries both gain. And Germany would be happy to be an engine for the creation of such a win-win situation. And that simply involves doing two things, giving the debtor countries support when they need it in times of crisis, and giving the creditor countries the reassurance that this crisis won't happen again because we have some sustainable institutions in place that will put Europe uh, on a sustainable path. Let me, let me ask you a little bit about bo both those. On the point about Germany, um, there is, I think you're right, a, 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 perhaps it's a caricature, but the general perception is that um, the German public has had enough, uh, that they're tired of bailing out the debtor countries, um, that, uh, that they, they um, are insistent that uh, no more bailouts. Um, and yet, um, it seems to me that the continuation of this um, austerity, the austerity measures is actually exacerbating the very problems that the Germans are trying to prevent. That's right. Uh, so if you try to force a country, uh, a government, to save in a time of deep depression, mm -hmm. it makes the depression worse. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And because countries in the Eurozone now have developed welfare states, mm -hmm. the consequences are much worse than in the interwar period because uh, a deeper recession means that tax revenues collapse and transfer payments rise. So the deficits uh, actually go higher, which the is the very... And the deficits go higher. And, and, and yet that um, opinion doesn't seem to be broadly re reflected, at least in a public sense. You know, you, it, it's, maybe it's a, it's a political season. Um, Not quite. I think um, Germany would like to have reassurances that Europe is on a sustainable track. Mm -hmm. There are two ways to put Europe on a sustainable track. Um, and uh, only one of them is valid. Um, the first way, which is not the valid way, which is the one we've tried, is to put governments under constraints now, mm -hmm. to get their house in order now. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work because they fall into a Keynesian trap, which mm -hmm. makes the deficit worse. A better way would be for all governments of the Eurozone to adhere to, to tie themselves to fiscal rules that specify over what period they are to reach a maximal ratio of debt to GDP of 60% as specified by the growth and stability and pact. And do, do you think that the, the uh, I mean, I, you mentioned the stability and growth pact, and the two rules, of course, are the 60% public debt to GDP ratio and the annual 3% um, uh, to a budget deficit to GDP ratio. Now, we've had those rules in place. Um, it's not, uh, I mean, even Germany's broken them. Nobody's really followed them, and I'm, I'm not sure that you can follow uh, um, an, an outcome, a pre-specified outcome, when if, uh, budget deficits in many respects are 
uh, endogenous, which is to say they're non-discretionary. They become a, a, an outgrowth or a symptom of a problem so that you have a larger deficit when you have a sick economy and you have a smaller deficit when you have a, a healthier economy. I think uh, we've learned a lot uh, since the last time. We had rules, but we had no implementation mechanism. And uh, that's like having a rule against theft, but... Uh, no jail sentences. <laughs> no sentences uh, if you're caught stealing. And, 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 and so what do you think we, we can actually do in, uh, uh, to well, improve... Well, there are several things we could do. Um, one is uh, put the fiscal rules into the constitution of a country. And mm -hmm. constitutions can be changed, but nevertheless they can't be changed easily. In addition, we could make the implementation of the rules automatic. And that is that if a country offends against its rule, then the value-added tax would automatically rise, so government spending would automatically fall, so that the rule would be implemented. Mm -hmm. And a country could easily tie itself to that. And then, of course, one could say there's now could be an outcry because the country loses fiscal sovereignty, but not if the country itself determines the nature of its fiscal rule. And I think there we arrive at sort of the crux of the issue. That is, if you allow a country to make decisions about government spending and taxes on a year-by-year -year basis, then most governments have deficit bias. Mm -hmm. That is. They spend too much in good times because political pressures are great. And in bad times, they have to spend more than they otherwise would in order to sort out the economic mess. And therefore, deficits rise uh, over time and that relative to GDP. And that's not possibly sustainable. So if a government ties its hands, like it does in monetary policy, by appointing an independent central bank that uh, has an inflation target, then a lot can be done. Um, one could credibly signal that over the long run, a government wants to have a ratio of debt to GDP of 60%. Uh, Forget the deficit rule. That mm -hmm. wasn't even consistent with the debt to GDP I don't even ratio. think it has any kind of economic logic. I mean, historically, no. uh, it's, uh, there's, there's no real need why it has to be 60 or 75. or uh, That seems to have been picked no, up in midair. You could take it out of midair, but 60 is not a bad number. Mm -hmm. And since the number is out there, it's like mm -hmm. inflation of 2%. You want to anchor people's expectations sure. to something, mm -hmm. may as well anchor them to that, because the number is out there. And now, once the government has specified that that's where we want to get to in the long run, then it just needs to specify two more things. One is the rate of convergence, how quickly you converge to that ratio of debt to GDP, and how counter-cyclical fiscal policy should be. That is, mm -hmm. how much can you stimulate an economy in a recession? Yeah. And if you stimulate an economy in a recession, then you clearly need to do the opposite when the economy is booming because otherwise you won't reach the long-run ratio. And the rule would specify these things. Mm -hmm. And the government would argue about the best rule to follow. And fiscal sovereignty would consist in the government making it the rule over the long run. And therefore, people for the first time in history would have the opportunity to talk about how much debt they want uh, the next generation to bear, how mm -hmm. much government debt uh, needs to fall on them. Now they can't talk about it because government expenditures and taxes are decisions that are made on a year-by-year -year basis. They're, they're made on a year-by-year -year basis, and yet, um, as you yourself know, because you brought the study of psychology and uncertainty into this, um, you know, the, the, we, we can't really uh, look at definitive outcomes because there is clearly um, uh, an element of unpredictability. Um, uh, as you are well aware, um, the uncertainty aspects uh, which go in other disciplines, such as psychology, don't seem to be implemented in, in, in economics. And so how does one implement a, a policy framework where you respect uh, those levels of uncertainty? You're going to be discussing this a little bit, I know, in the, at the conference. Well, here I think there is a simpler way out, uh, and that is to say you have a target. You're not sure whether the target is optimal, but it's better than business as usual. And if you're driven off target, say by an unexpected recession, then there's an automatic mechanism that brings you back to the target, but that allows you to 
respond positively to a recession anyway. And so if financial markets knew that in the long run, governments are committed to getting to a 60% debt to GDP ratio, but we don't know how long it'll take because we don't know what the business cycle will look mm -hmm. like. And all we do know is that when a bad recession hits, we can countervail it through fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. That would be a good situation. But if I could make one other point, and sure. that is, I'm basically giving you the moderate German position mm -hmm. uh, that tries to create a win-win situation. There are much more audacious plans, uh, like George Soros's plan for the Eurozone, mm -hmm. that uh, would be lead to comprehensive solutions that would require a lot more in the way of bargaining and that would be better ways of dealing with uncertainty because uh, they provide a greater sense of buffers. But well, this is not something that the, German, uh, the Germans or the German government at present would stand behind. It, it would be very hard, uh, um, especially uh, given what's happened the last few years. Although longer term, I, I, I guess the other thing that uh, George Soros talks about is the need for some sort of permanent uh, fiscal transfer union. And, uh, and, 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 and in those kinds of situations, um, imbalances, trade imbalances uh, amongst the various countries would become less relevant in much the same way, for example, that um, uh, w one doesn't care, for example, if Texas runs a large current account surplus with the other 49 states. Uh, we don't really know because we don't keep the, the, the data. And you hope that longer term we can move in that direction. Um, yes, I think that could be very far-sighted. Yeah. Uh, now, in the United States, it is possible to go bust. Uh, it is also not possible to have the analog of the large uh, imbalances among states, which yeah. are uh, the imbalances in the target two accounts at the central bank. It's not possible because gold is actually transferred between states mm -hmm. uh, at the end of each year. But in the long run, um, fiscal union is possibly something that uh, Europe must strive towards. Uh, and George Soros has a really good point in showing that this could be an important goal. One good way to achieve that would be to create more of a European identity. And at present, uh, the Europeans lack enough of a sense of identity so that the Germans do not believe with equanimity that they could transfer money to southern European states without any hope of getting them back. And it doesn't matter because we're all Europeans. There's not sufficient identity there. But things like the Erasmus program, better exchanges, better involvement of different European countries in common projects, will with time hopefully create more of a European identity that will allow for more of a transfer union. We hope for, so I, I guess that the, the, the challenge is that um, that's probably a generational task and yet um, these are crises that um, the markets are demanding you know, uh, solutions within the, in the next three to six months. So I, I guess that's going to be the challenge and it will be exacerbated by this uncertainty problem. So. Um, with that, I think we'll just uh, uh, you know leave it here. But I, I appreciate you sharing your uh, insights. Uh, they're very valuable, and I think it's important for people to hear the the moderate German position in this debate because it's not well represented. So thank you very much for speaking to us. Very pleased. Thank you.